All I can say is that it's a good thing Tone Poet only releases two titles a month. A guy could go broke trying to keep up with all these records. Hey, what's up? I hope you're doing great. I'm doing fantastic. I'm looking forward to Thanksgiving and potentially going into a turkey dinner coma on Thursday. And this is the time of year where I feel like we all need to hold on to our hats, man. It's like, I swear the holidays seem to pick up speed every single year. So this is my review of the 2024 Blue Note Tone Poet release lineup, where I'm gonna give you my honest opinion on each and every one of the 24 albums scheduled for release. So I've actually assigned a grade to each album, and these grades are just my opinion. If I give your album a C, please forgive me. It's probably only because I have too many other albums that are in the same ballpark musically, and I'm always looking for something different, surprising, or exceptional. Also, I might give an album a C one day and a B the next day. Part of music is objective, but the deepest and most precious part of music is personal and subjective. And that's what makes it so beautiful. And so we're not gonna agree on everything. And not only is that okay, but it's a relief that we all come to this with our very own taste that is very personal to us. All right, so there is a lot to cover in this video. So let me go over this list and tell you which albums I will be picking up and which ones I will be avoiding. All right, so Tone Poet Day kicks off on January 5th, 2024. And we start off with an album by Lou Donaldson called Midnight Creeper, released in 1968. Many of you will be familiar with Midnight Creeper. And I hate to start this list off on a mediocre note, but for me personally, Midnight Creeper is pretty standard fare. It's bluesy, which is very nice, but I mean, overall the album is just not my thing. It's not that it's not my thing, it's just that I feel like there are so many other albums that do what it does better that I already have in the collection. It has a great cover, I do love the cover, but this is probably one that I'm gonna avoid next year. We do get Lou Donaldson on alto, of course, Blue Mitchell on cornet, Lonnie Smith on organ, George Benson on guitar, and Idris Muhammad on drums. And which, I mean, that is a nice combo, which includes an organ and a guitar, but I don't know, it just feels, it just feels mid to me. So boom, first controversial take right out of the box. <laughs> I'm giving Midnight Creeper a C. The second album coming out in January is Polly Currents from Elvin Jones, originally released in 1969 on the Blue Note label. Now this is what I'm talking about. This is a very percussive album, which you would expect coming from the great Elvin Jones. I would say if you're a fan of Youssef Latif, you might dig this one. It's very jammy and just has some fantastic, unusual playing on it. It includes lots of flute, Bass flute, Wilbur Little is spectacular on bass. This album is right up my alley. I'm giving it an A. So the next two are released on February 2nd. We got a couple of bangers in that month. First off, we get Blue Mitchell's Down With It, Blue Note, 1965. And this one kind of caught me off guard a little bit. It's not an album that I'm very familiar with. After track one, I was about ready to write it off. Cause I'm, I'm really at a point where I want music that sounds different. When you listen to enough of this stuff, you're sort of, at least for me, I'm always craving something new, different, inventive. And track one kind of kicked off as sort of a nondescript standard fair kind of tune for me. But I'm glad that I stuck with it because this album really settles in after track one and it's a whole sequence of really fantastic tunes. So this one is going on my list. It features Chick Corea on piano. Chick Corea to me is like top 10, maybe even top five jazz pianists of all time. So, you know, I have to snag it if for no other reason for Chick. So I'm giving this one a B only because it starts a little slow, but I'll probably still pick it up just because of the rest of the album is very good. And then we have Joe Lovano's Trio Fascination, edition one. So this one's a more contemporary album released in 1997. And again, I was not very familiar with this album. The band is a trio and it features, not only does it feature Joe Lovano on tenor, soprano and alto, it also features Dave Holland and Elvin Jones. 
And this, of course, is at the end of Elvin's career, but he really brings a lot to the proceedings on this album, as does Dave Holland, who's played with Chick Corea, played with Miles Davis in the late 60s, early 70s, even appearing on Bitches Brew. And I would say that if you enjoy Holland and Elvin Jones, this album could be right up your alley. And that's not to take anything away from Joe Lovano at all. Trio Fascination is a post-bop album that flirts with the avant-garde without getting too out there, which is kind of a sweet spot for me. This is just a fantastic album. It gets an A, and I will definitely be adding this one to the collection. All right, so March 1st, we get Jackie McLean's Action, or Action, 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 depending on who you ask. I guess, I guess those titles are interchangeable. And I got one word, Bobby Hutcherson. And it, I mean, I guess that's two words. <laughs> I got two words. Bobby Hutcherson. Bobby Hutcherson, as you well know, the genius vibraphonist, appears on three Jackie McLean albums, and these two musicians always shine together. There's sort of this seductive energy that gets created that borders on the avant-garde. I mean, it really is avant-garde. I would, I would define Bobby Hutcherson as avant-garde. He does play straight jazz on occasion, but it seems like when McLean and Hutcherson get together, I mean, they're just tight. So along with McLean and Hutcherson, we also get Billy Higgins here. He's one of the premier avant-garde drummers in jazz. He's played a lot with Dexter Gordon, Ornette Coleman, Donald Byrd, and of course, Bobby Hutcherson. Cecil McBee is on bass. He's had an extremely prolific career, appearing on records by McCoy Tyner, Elvin Jones, Youssef Latif, uh, Pharaoh Sanders. All right, so this one is an A-plus album for me, and I will definitely be snagging it on day one. All right, so next up in March, we got Booker Irvin's Textbook Tenor, a Blue Note release from 1968. And guess what? We got Billy Higgins on drums again. I mean, these Blue Note sessions are all so good. Most of them are all so good. <laughs> We get uh, Woody Shaw on trumpet, Kenny Barron on piano, and all of the playing on this album is exceptional. Booker Irvin steals the show. He plays killer on this album, completely elevating uh, the rest of the musicians on this session. In a way, I kind of kind of wanted to come on here and say that Kenny Barron steals the show on this album because his playing is so amazing, but. The truth is, the whole lineup plays amazing. Everyone is tight and very, very swinging on this album. This is hard bop at its best, another necessary album. I give it an A and I will be snagging it. All right, April, April 5th, two albums come out. The first one is Horace Silver's, Silver's Serenade, Blue Note 1963. And for me, Silver's Serenade is not a must have album. It's fine, but in my opinion, uh, there's nothing super exceptional going on here. Uh, to me, it's, you know, it's fairly standard. It's, it can get monotonous after a while. At least it does for me. It's, it's just not my thing. I mean, and, and I like Horace Silver and this list is going to include another, uh, Horace Silver or a band that features Horace Silver. That's actually a very good album, but for me, this one just isn't it. So I give this one a C and I probably will not be picking up this album. On the other hand, we do have Anthony Williams with Lifetime coming out on the same day. And I really respect that this album does its own thing. All the compositions are done by Tony Williams and I just give it extra credit for being so different. This one might be an acquired taste for a lot of people. This is gonna be one of those albums that's fantastic when you're in the mood for it. It's not a swinging record packed wall to wall with solos, which in the case of this album is a very good thing. And this is more of an artistic album. It's moody, it's thematic, it's brilliant. And then another cool thing about Lifetime is just the recording. There's something about the acoustic ambience that kind of comes through on this recording, which I hope doesn't get lost when it gets transferred to tone poet, which I'm no doubt it will not get lost. And I don't even know if that makes sense. I might be crazy, but there's just something about the atmosphere of this album that I really like. This in a way is a masterpiece. I give it an A plus. Yes, I'll be snagging this one. All right, May 3rd, we got Bird's Eye View from Donald Bird. I'm sure a lot of people have been waiting from the, for this one as well. This was originally put out on Transition in 1955. And when I said we'd get to some 
fine, inspired Horace Silver. This is the album that I was referring to. And this album is such a treat. It's basically a jazz messengers album with Donald Byrd taking top billing. And it is every bit a jazz messengers album with Horace Silver, Hank Mobley, R. Blakey. What a swinging bluesy album as the messengers always are. Not Every song on this album is must have, but even the compositions that are a little more standard fare still have some great soloing. Track one, Doug's Blues, is just about worth the price of admission for me. I'm giving this one a B just because we've all kind of heard this album before, if you know what I mean. Don't get me wrong, it is fantastic. It's just, I already have this album in my collection, you know, 10 times over. All right, I've been waiting for this one. Bobby Hutcherson, Total Eclipse, Blue Night. Blue Night? Blue Tone 19, Blue Tone? <laughs> Blue Note 1968. Am I biased? Yes, I'm biased. But I am so glad that over these years that Tone Poet has been releasing fantastic albums that Bobby Hutcherson has actually been treated very, very well. And Total Eclipse, in my opinion, is one of Hutcherson's best. Why? We get Harold Land, Joe Chambers, and Chick Corea on piano. I mean, yes, please. This is my kind of lineup. And this album just swings. All of these musicians are fantastic, obviously, but in this case, almost more than ever, the sum is so much greater than the whole Wait, the whole is so much, wait, the sum, the sum is so much greater than the parts. Anyway, I don't know if Hutcherson and Korea played much on, on, on record. I mean, this might be the only one that I know of. And while that is a damn shame, it's also a huge reason to pick this one up. This one gets an A plus for me all day long. The worst part about it is having to wait six months for it to come out. All right, June 7th, we get Doug Watkins with Watkins at Large, Transition, 1956. So while Doug Watkins was a very prolific sideman, I'm pretty sure he only appeared twice on albums as a leader. This is a very welcome addition because this album is pretty tough to find. And if you can find it in decent condition, a decent pressing, it is gonna set you back a pretty penny. So I gotta imagine fans are very stoked that Tone Poet is putting this out. This is another bluesy album, another moody album, and another masterpiece of the other, what, two or three A-pluses that I've given out so far. This one is an A-plus for a different reason. This one just swings so hard. Hank Mobley appears on tenor. Donald Byrd is on trumpet. Kenny Burrell, of course, is on guitar. Duke Jordan on piano will have you reminiscing about the good old days with Count Basie. Together and with all the other musicians on this album, they just managed to create a tour de force. And it's refreshing because it is so classic in this case. A plus, I'll definitely be snagging this one. All right, Kenny Dorham and Jackie McLean into something. Pacific Jazz 1961. Here we have a live album recorded at the Jazz Workshop in San Francisco, my old stomping grounds. So this one is not for me. Again, it's just a little bit too pedestrian in my opinion. It's definitely carried by its solos and its groove, which is very good. Again, I just wanna stop for a second because just because I'm not gonna pick this album up doesn't mean it's a bad album. And when I say it's pedestrian, I don't know. I think maybe to a lot of people, this is the kind of music they really enjoy. It's just that for me, there are so many other albums like this and this doesn't really make any attempt to I don't know, break new ground or, it can tend to get a little fatiguing for me. Jackie McLean is always a genius. He's on here, especially with his playing on Let's Face the Music and Dance. But I, I just don't know if that's enough to carry this album. Just my opinion, but I will probably be avoiding this one. Snag this one for Jackie McLean, but this one is a C for me. All right, July 5th, we get Bird Blows on Beacon Hill by Donald Bird, originally released on Transition in 1956. And this one is a nice album of standards. And if it doesn't include all standards, it kind of seems like it includes all standards. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, except in this case, I kind of am. This album is fine. 
put it on in the background during cocktail parties and people will be, you know, tapping their toe and bobbing their head. But for me, there's just nothing really, again, exceptional here. I said the same thing about the remarkable Carmel Jones, though, when that one came out and there are people that love that album. But for me, Bird Blows on Beacon Hill gets a big C. All right, also on July 5th, we get Wayne Shorter with Odyssey of Iska, I guess it's pronounced, I-S-K-A. This was originally a Blue Note in 1970. And now we're talking. Ron Carter is on bass here. And this one is just a straight up romping avant-garde album. If you are familiar with Miles Davis's later stuff like Bitches Brew, then you might have some idea of what this is. Although I wouldn't even say it's more laid back than Bitches Brew. Bitches Brew maybe isn't even a good comparison. How about Forest Flower by Charles Lloyd? Or, I don't know, I'm doing a terrible job explaining this, but, and that might actually not be a bad thing because it kind of speaks to how, you know, interesting and unique this album is. It's definitely 1970s jazz, and for me, that's not a bad thing. I think that's really, really cool. I love that we got what we got in the 1970s. And in the 2020s, we can look back and reflect and appreciate all the different eras of jazz that we got in the 20th century. This album is not gonna be for everyone, but for me, there is definitely a time and a place for this one. I'm giving this one a B just because it's a little bit specialized. I can't listen to this all the time. I gotta be in the right mood, but this is a very, very good album. All right, next up in August, August 2nd, we get Lee Morgan's Taru. Again, I don't know if I'm butchering that title, T-A-R-U, Blue Note, 1968. This album was actually recorded in 1968, but not released until 1980. And this is an album that uh this out al this album ha this, <laughs> this album has its ups and downs it has some very great playing it has some mid stuff i'm saying mid mid kind of like pedestrian middle standard fare highlights for me are probably george benson on guitar and billy higgins on drums but at least for me overall this album is just a little bit basic i'm giving it a c and moving on all right we're back with some bobby hutcherson this time with medina blue note 1969 this is not one that i have in the collection currently so i guess i'll be waiting the better part of a year to snag this album, if I could possibly wait that long. And on this album, we get Harold Land on sax. And, and Harold Land um, will come up in 1970 when Bobby Hutcherson and Land record San Francisco, just an amazing album. And I mean, you know, what can I say? This is in my wheelhouse. This just, I love Hutcherson and Harold Land together. I mean, they sound fantastic the swinging the musicianship it's just second to none on this album and most of all it's sensitive and introspective which is something that we get from Bobby Hutcherson which is one of the things that I really truly love about him just listen to track two comes a spring they are everyone is in the pocket and there's no getting in or out just a beautiful song uh, track three, Dave's Chant. Listen for the first time Harold Land comes in on that album. And it's just, it's amazing. It'll just blow your socks off. I would have loved to have been in the room during these sessions, man. A plus for me all day long. All right, September 6th, the modest jazz trio. Good Friday Blues, Pacific Jazz, 1960. This is one that embarrassingly I was not familiar with. This is straight ahead jazz and actually a very good album. Jim Hall, who plays guitar, in my opinion, kind of steals the show on this record. But actually, the rest of the band does a fantastic job supporting him. Apparently, Red Mitchell who is normally a bassist, plays piano on this session, and it's very impressive. You would never know that this guy is not a piano player. He knows his way around a blues piano, and he he really kills on this record. Again, I, I don't really know a lot about it, except to say that it is very nice. I would give it a B, and I'm probably gonna pick this up. And then we have Jackie McLean, Let Freedom Ring, Blue Note 1962, and this is 
probably one of Jackie McLean's best albums as a leader, if not his best album. We get the rhythm section of Walter Davis, Herbie Lewis, and Billy Higgins. There is some extended playing on this album. You get track one is a 13 minute tune and three or four of the tunes were actually composed by Jackie McLean, which is a very good thing. This is just a fantastic album of swinging compositions. I'm guessing this is one that a lot of us have been waiting for. And of course, this one gets an A for me. It's so good. I will definitely be picking this one up. All right, it's October 4, and the first album we're gonna get is Booker Little 4 and Max Roach by Booker Little. This was originally a United Artists album from 1958. And here we have Booker doing his best Dizzy Gillespie. In fact, one of the tunes, Blue and Boogie, is a Dizzy composition. And Booker goes off on this album. We get Tommy Flanagan on piano, George Coleman's smooth tenor, and for some people, the biggest treat will be Max Roach on drums. And there's no denying that Max Roach's playing really shapes the sound of this album. But I will say this, especially if you're not familiar with Max Roach's playing, is that it can be a little in your face. So something to expect on this album. You will be hearing a lot of Max Roach. And so for this album, I think it's good, not great, or maybe maybe it's great, not fantastic. And the reason is because, honestly, the, uh, Max Roach playing can be a little fatiguing for me on this album. It's a little bit, it's too distracting, if I'm being honest. And there's not enough space on this album. It's sort of like one solo running into the other. And again, Max Roach is playing all the way through it. And so you don't really get a chance to take a breath on this album. That would be my only criticism of it. I know there are massive Max Roach fans out there um, that are not gonna agree with me on this one. Go listen to it. Let me know if you see what I mean. I probably will be avoiding this one. All right, Donald Byrd again, and this time we got Kofi, Kofi, K-O-F-I. Why am I having such a hard time with some of these? This is Blue Note, 1969 and 1970s when it was recorded, but it was not released until 1995. And this one has a massive lineup. Highlights for me are, surprise, Ron Carter on bass, of course, Donald Byrd on trumpet. And this is kind of a funky, some, sometimes Latin infused, 70s jazz sounding album. And it, it's, a, it's even a little bit psychedelic and it's very, very good. I really enjoy the compositions on this album. There's just a lot to like about it. I'm gonna give it a B plus. And to be honest, I'm after that glowing review, I'm still kind of on the fence about whether I'm gonna snag it or not. We'll see how I'm feeling next October. All right, November 1st, we got Clifford Jordan with Cliff Jordan, Blue Note 1957. And so I'm just gonna be honest with you, I've not heard a lot of this album, but I am a fan of Cliff Jordan. I did have a chance to sample a couple songs off here. It has a star studded lineup with Lee Morgan, Paul Chambers, Art Taylor, among others. The rhythm section is really in the pocket and sound really good. And that is enough for me. I will definitely be snagging this album when it comes out. It is an A for me. Bobby Hutcherson again with Dialogue. Dialogue is one that I missed the first time it came out, so I am very happy this one is coming out. I am only sad that they're waiting until the end of the year to reissue this one, but this, it, this is just a killer album. Blue Note, 1965. This is actually the first Hutcherson album as a leader that we got at the time, but then the kicker was released recently, which actually was recorded material from before this album. So now the kicker uh, holds the prize for earliest Bobby Hutcherson material as a leader. And all these compositions were either written by Andrew Hill, who plays piano on this album, or Joe Chambers, who plays drums. And this is a five-star Hutcherson album for an album that doesn't include any Hutcherson compositions, which is hard for me because I hold Hutcherson in very high regard when it comes to uh, composing songs. I mean, I think he's one of the best jazz composers of all time. And of course, he gets his day in the sun on many albums, just not on this one, but that's not a bad thing, by the way. I mean, these these tunes are great. I don't say that to mean I don't like these tunes because they're not Hutcherson arrangements. I just mean these are fantastic tunes that are not Hutcherson arrangements. <laughs> 
And this is just a fantastic album with incredible playing, including, I don't even think I mentioned Freddie Hubbard on trumpet, who just slays on this album. A plus for me. All right, December 6th, then we got Freddie Roach with Good Move, Blue Note 1963. And I'm guessing this is another album that a lot of fans have been waiting for. And it is fantastic news that it is getting the tone poet treatment. Freddie Roach is an organ player in the tradition of Jimmy Smith or Larry Young, but he very much has his own swinging style. This album features Hank Mobley on like four of the tracks and his playing is laid back and cool. This is a really great album. I give it an A, I will be snagging one. All right, so we're at the end of our list. Last but not least, Hank Mobley's A Slice of the Top, Blue Note 1966. But this is another one that wasn't released until way later in 1979. And this album has a killer lineup like Lee Morgan on trumpet, McCoy Tyner on piano, who just kills on this session. Billy Higgins on drums, who just kills on this session. And, and I love some Hank Mobley, especially when he's inspired. And, and he is on this album. This is a really, really nice album. All of these arrangements are by Duke Pearson, who worked a ton as a leader, but also arranged music for the likes of Lou Donaldson, Grant Green, Lee Morgan, among others. This is a nice album, but it's a B for me. And I may or may not snag it. I don't know, we'll, we'll see how I feel in 13 months. All right, even more than in past years, I feel like Blue Note really did a great job curating this list. Am I a little biased? Yes, we got three more Bobby Hutchersons. Jackie McLean is all over this list. Donald Byrd. We even get a little, a very little, Chick Corea. I think about half this list, probably 11 or 12 albums are must haves for me. I will definitely be picking them up. There is a lot to like about this list. I think 2024 promises to be a very good year for tone poet lovers and a very bad year for your wallet. But I mean, look, if you love this stuff, that's a good thing. Let me know what you think in the comments section. And what do you think of my list? I totally nailed it, right? I know, I know, I totally nailed it. Anyway, I hope you liked this video. If you did, I hope you'll consider subscribing. It helps the channel out more than you know. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time.